Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this online event entitled In Conversation with Martin Hunt. And that was the Pasadena Tabernacle Songsters singing Creation Sings, conducted by our special guest, Martin Hunt. It's so good that you could join with us. Please do hit that like button, leave a comment, let us know that you are with us and where you are watching from, and do uh, use that chat function and that comment function to leave some comments as we go. It's good to know that you're with us and uh, you're very much part of this conversation. But welcome, Martin. So good to have you with us. Thank you for making the time to spend some time with us this evening, or certainly this afternoon for you. First and foremost, how are you doing? And what have you been doing to keep yourself busy during this period of COVID and of lockdown? Well, it is great to be with you. Um, I uh, want to say, first of all, that uh, that was the first time I've actually seen that video. Um, so that did bring back a, a lot of really good memories. And I think uh, some of us looked terrified, um, which we were, because that, I think that was the first time we performed on that stage. Um, it is great to see you all and to be part of this. Uh, uh, I know you've had um, a lot of distinguished and wise and intelligent people on this call. So uh, I'm not quite sure how I ended up here, but I'm certainly grateful to be part of this. And uh, I've had a very quick look and I see some very familiar faces, uh, including my mom and my aunt, which is nice uh, on here tonight. Um, but it's really, really good to be here. Um, this last year for all of us um, has been, you know, the year that we can't really describe. Um, and uh, I think for me in particular, it's been a, a very busy, busy year of work. Um, it's been very demanding. There's been a lot of change, a lot of, uh, you have to adapt very quickly to a lot of things. Um, so it's been a very, very busy year. Um, I'm grateful that I've had employment this entire year. Um, I'm grateful that we've managed to sustain some level of ministry and maybe in certain areas we've actually grown um, in our service to others, which I think is, is wonderful and uh, certainly very important at this time. Um, I have found some time to uh, make, reach out to my friends. You know, we, we find it hard to see each other, um, poor friends, but we've uh, figured out how to do that. Um, I've not been able to travel home um, to England this year, which has been a shame. And um, hopefully in the future, you know, I'm starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I am fortunate to have received my vaccinations and now uh, um, we're just hoping we get through this next few months and start to see some new normal, um, not this old normal. <laughs> I think that's what I'm looking forward to the most. And so Martin, you work for the Salvation Army's USA Western Territory. You're currently talking to us from Territorial Headquarters uh, in Los Angeles, and you are the Assistant Territorial Secretary for Program. Now, that also includes the uh, Music Department, which is one of the departments within that wider program section. Now, Martin, you've been a core music section leader for many years. You've regularly conducted ensembles at music camps. You're an accomplished cornet player. Music is clearly a big part of your life. When did you discover your love for music and who were those key influences? Well, first of all, to say that I've been doing this for a long time, it's a little uh, scary. It doesn't feel like that. Um, but, uh, you know, if I, if I look back, you know, I, those of you that don't know me, I, I'm an officer's kid. So, you know, I, I had the privilege of growing up in um in several cores, in several different locations. My first um, musical memory was when my mom and dad were the divisional youth secretaries in Birmingham, in the Birmingham division. And uh, it was music school season. And um, I can remember being given the first cornet lesson at that um, by one of the instructors. But then um, at age uh, eight, we moved to Bristol Eastern. And uh, there were some folks on the school I see from Bristol Eastern. And some of them, I'm going to list, say their names, so uh, not planned for them to be here. But uh, I, I can remember as a young boy listening to um, the lyrical playing of the, the Bristol Eastern Band under the leadership of Don Jenkins. And in particular, you know, successful music groups are often built around pillars. And uh, 
and the pillars of that band at that time, um, you know, was obviously Don's gift of musicianship of, of bringing melody out, and emotion, and uh, of lines and music. Um, but that was only because of the of the pillars in the band and you know, Martin Bryant, uh, Colin, who did incredible uh, horn sound, um, Chris Mallet on the phone, and Andrew Justice, Nathan James. And uh, Trevor Caffrey, you know, some of the some of the names that uh, that, that stick with me as um, helping form this uh, this beautiful sonorous sound that this band made. And every Sunday night we get to listen to it. I can still remember at the end of the Sunday meeting, and I, and I I can't remember a word that my dad or my mom preached, of course, but I can remember the band playing Rapture at the end of the Sunday meeting, and um, and just hearing that and wanting to find ways to express that through my own musicians from an early age. Uh, we had a really good wifey band. I get, I guess in hindsight, it probably wasn't really good, but it felt it as a kid. Um, and uh, Trevor Cattle uh, eventually was the wifey band leader. And, um, Trevor took a big interest in uh, not just as musicians, but as who we were. Um, and in fact, he gave me my first, uh, my first local officer position. I was the wifey band librarian. And I thought it was the most fantastic thing ever. But what it was, um, was Trevor seeing young people and trying to figure out how to become connected. Um, I also, during that time, uh, started attending music school. Again, there was some, um, some massive uh, musicians there who um, music was not the most important thing they brought to those music schools, but it was their, um, their gift of encouragement. Uh, Chris Priest, Cliff Matthews, Roger Seven, Chris Kent were all really instrumental in, in encouraging the music. So, as I think about all those people, you know, I, I, I can't um, not also mention my dad, um, who I think was an incredibly underrated musician. Um, he would just go to the piano and play melody, anything from any tune he heard, he could sit at the piano and play. And I can remember as a young boy, we were on holiday. I think it was the only time we ever went as a family on holiday overseas. And we were in the south of France, and I was getting ready to take, I think, my grade eight on it. Um, and I was probably 11, 12, and I had to practice my scales. And I didn't take my cornet with me. Um, I don't know why. Uh, I guess I was too cool for that in those days. Uh, now it would go with me because if I don't play it for a day, I can't play the next day. Um, but dad would sit at the table in this caravan and say, uh, D minor scale, and I would have to do the fingering. And he could tell if I was doing it right. I, I couldn't even tell you now if I was doing it right, uh, but he could tell just visually. So um, uh, a great musician and uh, that uh, I think uh, helped um, lots of young people in their career too. That was important. Uh, so this is a long story, sorry. Um, then we, um, we moved to Regent Hall and um, I sat in the band uh, with Peter Graham, the bandmaster. Um, uh, Sue Stark was the scene company leader and she, uh, was, I think I was 14 when we got there, and she immediately asked me to become a scene company pianist. So immediately I was doing something, uh, you know, three times a Sunday, playing the piano for the scene company. Um, and Steve Hanover uh, was the writing band leader and asked me to be the deputy. Just a white band, so I got to do some conducting at a very early age out in the open air, um, all safe places where it can go wrong if you don't bring the band in right. <laughs> um, but then got to lead the community singing in some evening meetings. And then uh, I guess um, David Dawes uh, was the bandmaster for a while and had a great impact on my uh, playing and encouraging my playing, as did uh, Keith Hutchinson, who um, his wife Shirley attended the. Was a great quote. But I also had a, a couple of other things that, that I remember as a, a teen, young teenager. Um, my school orchestras, um, a very good school orchestra at Bristol Grammar School, and then at Dulwich College in London. Um, I think absorbing those different styles of music, uh, I don't know if I appreciated it as much then as I, as I do now. Um, but learning, um, learning how to blend with uh, strings and all those uh, things that are interesting in the art. Um, uh, it was something that I weren't used in the, in the last years as the, as the song solider. Um, 
But if I can just say one story that ties all this together, um, through all of all of those influences in my life, musically, and you know, I, I really wanted to be um, a really good piano player. Uh, that was my you know, I was focused on that. Practiced all the time. I was driven by parents and crazy. Um, every time I could, I'd be playing like that. Um, and um, you know, I wanted to be Goals and so I wanted to be the best I could be. I was always terrified to stand up and play um, in case I made a mistake. I was always looking for affirmation that was okay, was that okay? Um, and then in 1990, um, Al Ford called, you know, posted a, a song for the gay, um, the Congress, and uh, the American song for the gay. And uh, they came on stage and we were sat there and that struck me uh, uh, and that's that that stuck with me for really years and the sense of responsibility Martin, thank you so much for your thoughts on that one. I mean, that was a, a lot of names there, a lot of people who we would be able to, um, you know, picture in our own minds and who will have been influences either directly or indirectly to ourselves. Um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about your music ministry and particularly your your really impactful global ministry as uh, the songs leader as the, of the Pasadena Tabernacle Songs in due course. But that really has set the scene so well. Thank you so much for, for those thoughts, Martin. Now, previously mentioned, you're the Assistant Territorial Program Secretary for the USA Western Territory. What on earth does that mean, Martin? Can you tell us a bit about um, that role and how has that role changed in recent months due to the pandemic? Well, um, so the USA Western Territory, uh, I'm not gonna assume you know what that is. Um, you know, there's 50 states in the United States, USA Western Territory, uh, there's 13 of them, um, which is from Alaska uh, down to the southern part, southern California, all the way out to uh, Colorado, and then all the way out to the Pacific Islands, to Hawaii, which is a really tough place to go for a project. And then all the way around, almost to the, uh, to, almost to New Zealand and Australia, um, the Marshall Islands. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's part of the USA Western Territory. So my role um, as the Assistant Program Secretary is to help them with the management oversight all of the uh, program section. Um, so that's core ministries, um, that's the music department, which I said earlier, our social services department, which is vast, um, the youth department, our multimedia uh, department, and the statistics and events. Uh, so I, I'm responsible for all of that territory. So I, I basically give management uh, to that on behalf of the cabinet. Um, I was working for the program secretary, um, and uh, I get to attend the um, divisional, divisional reviews, um, so lots of things around the territory. Um, but this last year, uh, our main goal, um, normally, normally on the campus here at THU, we had you know, 30, 40 people. I think it's probably 30 people or so. Um, so it's a bit of a ghost town. Um, but during this pandemic, uh, our primary roles um, have been to provide resources for online worship. Um, we've, we've made a lot of territorial online worship meetings. Um, in fact, I just looked at some stats this year, uh, this last week, that uh, uh, our online worship territory in one And to me, that's exciting. It doesn't replace in-person worship, but it, uh, it's a bunch of people in the nation. 
Um, but at the beginning of the pandemic, how terrible the pandemic uh, tasked me and one of my media team to help communicate with the army on the streets of the country, um, to communicate that we believe in a hope that is far greater than any fear. Um, and I think um, one of the things you said was, is, you know, this moment we're in, in 2020, is, is the wartime mode of decades ago, where people in the public will look back at the Soviet Union in 2020, 2021, and say they were there for me, they were there for me. Um, so in those first few months, we traveled with them, um, it, just in the LA area, we could travel further, um, but we went to homeless shelters, we went to uh, Skid Row, uh, we went to uh, Salvation Army charity shops that we had converted into uh, shelters. Uh, we went to hotels that the government had asked the Salvation Army to turn into shelters for people in the streets. Um, we went to food drive and food um, box distribution where we take boxes of food and hand them to thousands of people at, uh, at stadiums. And we caught all of this on film, we were telling the story. So in those first um, four months, uh, we produced 130 videos about something. So a lot of my time uh, was absorbed with that. And then figuring out how we do commissioning, and welcome to cadets, and all those kind of things, which, was, uh, which I said last year, I never wanted to do again. But here we are, <laughs> a year later, planning for the same kind of you're certainly in the thick of it and having been uh, to THQ, although you're now in a different building to when I last visited, um, you're certainly really in and amongst the, the key um, ministry opportunities for, for the territory and having seen on social media many of the initiatives of the territory, uh, what a blessing uh, that has been to see and I'm sure a blessing to have been a part of and uh, the USA Western Territory really does lead the way on many things particularly your media, and you mentioned those online events and some great uh, online events which have been uh, put on during this pandemic. Martin, just oh, before I ask the next question, just um, could you get a little bit closer to the mic? Because you're just yep. dipping in and out a little bit. That would be very helpful. Um, so you, you sold you at the Pasadena Tabernacle Corps. That's where you are um, on, the, on the role, and you currently serve there as the Deputy Bandmaster. Right. For many years... You were the songs leader and led a very dynamic group, which really had a, a global ministry. You led many tours and produced several innovative recordings. I mean, I absolutely love the, the, the recordings that you made with the, the Tab Songsters. Why do you think the ministry of recordings is important in the Salvation Army? And how did you go about preparing the group for such uh, an undertaking? And what guided your repertoire choice? Uh, well, you know, I think uh, recordings are definitely um, our modern day open air. Um, you know, it's very difficult, particularly here in, in America, to uh, take, a, take a band or a vocal group or anyone out into the streets. Um, but, you know, it's really easy to send someone a recording um, and, and tell them why. And in fact, I, I got a recording in the mail yesterday from my mom. Thank you, mom. Um, it's a Gemma Kinsley's new CD thankful and it's stunning it's great but when i got it out of the out of the envelope the first thing i had to think to myself is how am i going to play this i don't have a cd player at home i don't have one in the car um so i had to wait until i got to work this morning to actually listen to it and get it onto my itunes um and and i think that what i'm saying by that is um we've always got to start to look forward so how do we adapt so recordings are incredibly important um, and I think years ago, we used to make recordings to um, showcase um, our talents or how good we were or uh, what we were capable of producing. And I think um, the trend has got to be we make recordings to communicate with us. Uh, and, and maybe we have to adapt um, what music we use. So when I've been working on the songs to CDs, um, we've only ever done them in conjunction with a tour. Um, and that is really um, for one main reason, that was a fiscal reason. We could only afford to 
produce the CDs in the way that we were producing them, which is with a full orchestra, um, where we knew we were going to sell a lot of them to make our money back. Um, so the, the programming for the CDs was driven by the programming that we got for the tour programs. So those of you that have seen the songs from the tour, okay, it's the same program every night. Uh, and so uh, we would develop a theme, um, Things in Love is the theme in 2006. And we would, we would find the music that we've got in our repertoire maybe for the last two or three years that fits into that theme. And then start to develop um, which of these songs can we record. And um, it's, it's incredibly difficult. It's, it's got to be a blend of music. Um, and the group has got to like the music. If they don't like the music, they are not going to rise to the performance level. Um, and sometimes the music that you choose is just the sheer enjoy, enjoyment. And sometimes it needs to be a little more intense to grab, grab people to give them less. Um, there was a time early on um, when I first became the song leader um, in 1999. Uh, I was 27 years old, uh, which in hindsight is way too young to have this kind of responsibility. Um, but I guess you have to have it at some point. But I was, I was, I received a little bit of um, constructive criticism. It wasn't intended to be, to be harsh in any way. But uh, why was I not using more army music? Um, and my response to that was, well, it's army music when we start singing it. Um, you know, there's 70 of us in full salvage army uniform singing this music. Uh, just because the composer doesn't happen to be a salvage, it's, it's, it becomes army music. And I look back at the songs that the Cab songs uh, have recorded over the years, uh, but many of them you will recognize these names, but the Cab songs have recorded The Majesty and the Glory of Our Name, uh, which is one of my other favorite songs, but that was recorded in 1986. Um, and then a few years later, we recorded God on My Praise, I Know a Friend, uh, With All My Heart, Know My Heart, uh, Bow the Knee, your grace that amazes me, he's always been faithful. Um, and those are songs that I think we, uh, the Tab songs have probably introduced to the army repertoire, to the songs that songs that we gave all over the world to sing. And I, I'm not saying that because I'm, I'm trying to be boastful in any way, but I think that was part of our, uh, our role in the army music world, is to introduce something new. Um, and then um, I think on the last CD that I, I produced, um, Song of Praise, um, I decided to, to look back and we took some army tunes and but we gave them new life with an orchestration. So um, Ivor Bazanka's Two Life Cross I Can Come Here, uh, the beautiful song Everywhere, um, Les Condon's uh, Song of Praise. Uh, we had orchestrations written for those songs so that they would have new life and new energy. But when, I, when it comes, the actual recording process for us. Um, it's knowing your capabilities is the first key. Uh, uh, the songsters need to feel comfortable. There's no point in us, the cab songsters, uh, when I was the songster leader, trying to record music that the ISS was um, We're not going to sound that good. We're not that good. Uh, but we can bring some new uh, energy and uh, dynamism to, to some music. Um, so it will take about a two year process, I think, for me to be ready to hit the studio. The, uh, the group must feel very comfortable with music. In fact, uh, they should be able to stand in the studio to sing it by memory. Okay? So uh, uh, that's where I wanted them to be for the first recording session. Um, because we do it, because we record uh, with an orchestra, um, there's a lot of tracking that happens. So I would spend hours and hours and hours in, um, in music notation software like Sibelius, uh, putting in a piano part so that I could make sure my tempos and the speeding up and the slowing down felt natural. And I would converse with that. Um, and out of that, I'd create, create a click track that we would take into the studio for two or three days with the piano, bass, and drums. And then a couple of days later, we'd bring in a string section. Um, and there were pros uh, from Hollywood, and they would record the strings, and then um, woodwind, and then brass and percussion. 
So it's a lengthy process before the songs is even get. And so um, I would find, I learned tricks, how to help the songs to feel comfortable about recording, um, how to change their, the way they're standing when they're singing out of tune, um, get used to having one ear covered with a headset. Um, and then there's other key things that we have to consider. You know, we have to consider the studio. The studio you sing in or the hall that you sing in has got to resonate well with the voices you have. Um, and it's got to have enough batting in the 70s. That's another practical thing we have to think about. Um, and uh, the formation that everyone stands in, uh, I probably went through three or four um, versions of the standing formation for the recording so I got the sound that I was hoping to create uh, in mixed voices. Um, the person who is behind the sound desk, the engineer, uh, incredibly vital. We've been so blessed that a gentleman by the name of Dan Bessinger has worked with us for, for 20 years or so, producing our recordings. Um, not only is he a wonderful Christian, but he's an expert in, in this field. Um, and he, 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 uh, he would help me get the orchestra together too. And I can remember one day we were filming the, recording the strings and we were about to, we took a lunch break. And the next song that we were going to record for the strings was a song called At Your Mercy Seat. And during lunch, Dan said to me, hey, you, should, um, you should tell them what that means, what At Your Mercy Seat means. I was like, I mean, it's, they're on the clock. I'm not allowed to, to preach to them or they're, they're paid employees like at this moment. It's no, when it hits the top of the hour, they're yours. You can say whatever you want. So I thought nothing more of it. I was just probably not going to do that. And then the session started and we got to the first part of the introduction. Dan hit his talk back button and said, said to everyone in the room, hey, Martin, what does at your mercy seat mean? So I then got this opportunity to talk to these musicians, Hollywood musicians, um, about what it means to be a So that was a really, really powerful moment. Um, the, other, the other super key thing for me in the recordings is perfection is not vital. It really is not vital. Um, so often we drive to the you know, digital age to be perfect. And um, you can sing something 12 times and after the third time, it's not going to get better. The other nine are not going to get better. And all it does is demoralize and make people feel discouraged. It's not worth it. It's perfection. Preparation is that. Perfection. So that's probably the little glimpse into the process. That's really interesting, Martin. Thank you so much for sharing those thoughts with us. I mean, the, the Tab songs, as you say, have been trendsetters in terms of songs to ministry and a lot of the songs that you've listed uh, our own songs to brigade sings and many others in the uk and beyond sing as well and, and as you say this the tab really introduced those to us and rewidened the repertoire and not only just right widen the repertoire but also widen concepts of um how to present as you say standing in different formations through innovative uh, concert programs and of course as you say the orchestrations are fabulous too. And so thank you so much for, for sharing an insight into how you oversaw these really impactful global ministry uh, opportunities. Now, our opening video uh, was from the Songsters singing at the O2 Arena as part of the Boundless Congress in 2015. Briefly, Martin, could you tell us just a little bit about what your memories are of the Boundless Congress? Well, the Boundless Congress started for us after a six-day tour. So I was exhausted before we uh, before we got to the O2. And we were traveling um, the Tab Songsters and the Tab Youth Chorus and a whole lot of other people. So there were about 120 of us. And uh, I was responsible for the logistics of that movement of that huge ship. So um, the things that I remember the most for me was the first thing was the pre-Congress event. Did, uh, with the ISP in the Boundless Theatre, uh, which I think was just a big tent. Um, and I, I, we were standing on the stage right behind the ISP. I was standing literally in the, in the tuba section. And, um, and I, could, I can sense, and I, and I knew I knew well the, the people in the band, and they knew me as a young kid. And um, I could sense and feel the encouragement that they were giving to me. 
and um, and that was one of the first things that struck me. Uh, and and I think maybe some of them were feeling a little proud, and uh, and that 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 feeling of um, achievement was really good. Um, now we're from California, so we're used to it being very hot. Um, that's yeah, 100 degrees, you know, 40 degrees Celsius plus is nothing for us. We're used to that, but we're not used to it inside. We're only used to it outside. So to walk into those venues and it be so far, it was quite, quite a shock for our system. And that first night, um, we had the first main session and then the tab songs were on for the after concert in the, uh, in the Indigo Theater. And it, it had to be, you know, 40 plus degrees uh, in that room. And um, we took our tunics off and did our best. But uh, I can remember about how, how hot it was. But I think the thing that the lasting memory, though, is, is seeing some of the new salvations in my group. Um, maybe Ricardo or some of the others who have been through some of our addiction programs, um, who are members of the songsters, uh, seeing the internationalism and seeing that they belong to something bigger than Pasadena, bigger than the Los Angeles, bigger than Southern California, bigger than the Western Territory, um, and the excitement of belonging to something. And I think uh, as I get older, um, I, I don't want to lose sight of the excitement of belonging to something bigger than what I can see. And, I, I can see and you've highlighted there that music is very much about relationships and community as much as it is actually making the music itself and so we're going to listen to the tab songsters now from the boundless congress singing kevin larson's setting boundless Found the salvation for you and for me. 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 Found the salvation for you.
What a great song and so much energy from the group and and even more energy from that conductor who was really going for it in places as well. And so, Martin, I'm sure that brings back some great memories uh, for you and what an opportunity uh, for you and the Songsters. And so you've lived in the USA for a number of years now, but as you've mentioned, you originate from the UK and you've touched upon some of the call that you've um, soldiered at through your parents being uh, officers. Regent Hall, you've mentioned Bristol Easton. What do you perceive are the key differences between the Salvation Army in the UK and the USA? Uh, that's, a, that's a really tough question. I think, um, I think that song helped set that question up because the, the, the big similarity is that, that no matter where we are in the world, that song and the words of that song uh, mean something to us as Salvationists. And I think, um, you know, uh, the army salute is the same no matter where you are. And by the way, if you want to know how to get a, a, the applause at an army event, finish the song with everyone doing the army salute. It doesn't matter what the sound is like. If you do the salute at the end, everyone's going to clap. Um, but I think that it's, it's hard for me um, to know really the differences because, you know, I, I've lived in the States for 27 years now, almost. And, um, and I was 21 when I left. And, um, and so, but I think that the biggest difference is, uh, I think the army in the States is a little more complicated. Um, and I think, um, and I mean that business and financially wise, um, we have some very, very vast programs and vast um, financial support from, from the public and the government, which makes the, the structure of the army just a little more complicated and I'm not saying that because the UK isn't doing lots of great things, because it is. Um, it's just uh, on a larger scale, the business side of running the army. And we talk a lot about protecting the corporation, which is protecting the assets in the Salvation Army. It takes up a lot of time and energy in, in the USA. And uh, one of the things which is also quite different, I suppose, is, is the big um, music camp culture. Um, that there is across there and the connection between you and I is um, meeting through the Western Music Institute back in 2015. Um, so let's turn to, to that for a moment and think about engaging young people uh, in church uh, and within the Salvation Army. It's so important and even now our music groups continue to be ways for young people to connect with God and to deepen their faith. So Martin, through your work, with various Salvation Army ensembles and at various music camps in the USA. Please could you share with us some of the highlights of working with young people within the Salvation Army and how music ministry was a key vehicle in these situations? Yeah, so uh, music ministry is, is just disciple. That's, that's what it is. Uh, it's it's disciple. It's getting people and helping each other grow in our relationship. So music is the, is the, is the, the, the thing that captures us and holds us in, but it's really about discipleship. Um, I, I, I was incredibly blessed that uh, at one point when 
by leadership of the Psalms, there were 70 of the single Psalms, and 30 of the members of the group were under the age of 30. And, and that was a real blessing for me, and also a lot of work in um, many ways. Um, and, and many of those young adults, and they're not so young adults anymore, um, still still call me affectionately Uncle Martin. Now, I never thought that they would come, that I would call that. Um, but I think it's because uh, I intentionally have built relationships. I, I, go, going to uh, football games and going to uh, school concerts and going to graduation parties um, and making um, all of our young people feel that I, um, and And using talents early, I think for so long in the Army, have this structure of, uh, and I'll, I'll use band as an example. And this is not intended to be criticism of the band, I, I love band. But you know, you join the band, you join the band on second form. And you stay on second form until you serve your time on second form. And then you maybe move on to first form. If you're really lucky, you might move on to solo form. But really, the reality is you should have been a solo form for the day you walk into the core world. And I think uh, that's detrimental in many ways because, first of all, it elevates one wall over another. And second of all, it doesn't give young people um, the, the feeling of the value of this community, where they are. With them. And I think that's that's really important. I've tried to do that. With, you know, um, we talk about highlights. I think every year the highlight for me is the process and seeing um, young adults that I've not seen for a year and seeing how much they've grown. And some of them have gone musically, and that's great too. But that to me is secondary. Um, but to see their the growth in the, the spiritual war, to see some of them come to the offices, to see them become leaders. Um, and even, yes, to see some of them leave uh, our church and go somewhere else and take that. Um, that well, that, that grieves me. It's also good that they're involved in something else. And, uh, um, so I, 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 am, I like to see. Ministry to young people is, should be no different than ministry to anyone else. It should be encouraging in what it does. We recently um, we shot a video um, in the fall that was in response to um, the awful race riots that were happening. And, and we just had this very quick idea we wanted to take six young six young people to say high school. Um, and then we, uh, we pulled out of the bank rock and said, here's the two make the channel buttons. You write a little string to effect. You go to string to effect. And we put them in the studio. I got to sing and make the two channel buttons. And it was just so moving to see this because I knew that my wife really meant this. And they were communicating to me that with us all the time, but really with different things to work. And they were saying, hey, um, and I, when I can call you do that, I would encourage our communities to have a voice and to uh, share their talent and their gifts and their concerns and their fears. Uh, that brings us a ground of a sense of hope. Again, we touch upon that word of relationships and of community and how we can really build people up uh, within our music sections within our music camps, uh, within our programs. And moving on to this, this next question then, Martin, thinking about um, the post-COVID era, we anticipate this post-COVID uh, era, and certainly here in the UK, we have a, a roadmap that's been published by the government as to when we hope things uh, will go back to some sort of normality. So what advice would you be giving music leaders in advancing their music groups, particularly thinking about this uh, post-COVID era, and what messages do you have for the Salvationist musicians listening in who may be feeling a little bit discouraged and possibly have switched off a little bit because of the length of time that they've been out of action? And again, if you could just come a little bit closer to the mic, Martin, that'd be really uh, great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, you know, the post-COVID days, you don't really know what to look like. And, um, but I, I think... Um, the first part of your question for the leaders, 
just gotta be grateful. You gotta, you gotta know that, um, that despite us, God is still gonna work through our, our church and who we are. You know, we are uncertain. He's got a plan in place and he knows what he's gonna do. And we just need to be faithful and we need to be adaptable. Um, I, I don't think every, every core is gonna look the same. <laughs> it doesn't now, it didn't before, and it's not going to the future. We've gotta be okay with that. Um, but we've also got to be willing to to reach out to people who maybe, uh, as you said, are feeling discouraged. And um, I hope we're not waiting for that moment until we open up our doors and we say, "Hey, everyone, come to song or come to band," and we realize people haven't come because they're discouraged, and we've not spent the energy and the time out to them in the last year. Um, that that's a problem. If that's the case. Um, and also, I think also I think everyone has to recognize. Um, that the leaders are also feeling the same insecurity and discouragement. Um, and we're um, not sure about the future either. Um, it's the same thing, you know, none of us have been through this before. None of us has a, has a, has a way to know how to handle this. Um, so uh, if you're not a leader, uh, I encourage you to reach out to your leaders, um, give them a word of encouragement too, because they don't have any issues yet either. And uh, they need to know uh, your love and your support. But ultimately, all of this, all of this music making business is, is about it's, it's about fellowship, it's about growing together. And I think um, we are all yearning for that. Um, if you're listening today and maybe you found it a little easier on a band practice night or a song practice night to sit up and watch TV, I don't know if you stand to sit on you know, what you stand for, whatever it is. Um, and or on a Sunday, it's much easier to, to watch the service with a cup of coffee. That's great, but that is not the longevity fellowship that as Christians we're called to do. Absolutely, and just looking at our um, chat on Facebook, Commissioner Robert Street has posted, there is no substitute for letting people, young and old, know that they are valued and he says thank you martin so thank you commissioner for your, for your contribution uh, to that uh, particular chat feed and thank you for your thoughts and for your encouragement martin it's really good to hear and helpful to hear at such a time we're going to uh, have another break and we're going to listen to martin uh, play a cornet solo before he shares uh, a word of scripture and i close uh, the, the session in prayer but this is a cornet solo trust in god featuring martin accompanied by Neil Smith.
words to that uh, song, uh, words that I think of when I play that. Uh, uh, the chorus by the love that never seems to hold me, by the love that bowed me, shed for me. While thy presence and thy power enfold me, I renew my covenant through thee. And I think the second verse is the one that uh, has stuck with me uh, this last year. Um, but my heart at times with care is crowded, oft I seek with weak or laden hands. And that early joy grows dim and clouded as each day is heavy, cold in hands. Have I ceased from walking close beside thee? Have I grieved thee with an ill-kept vow? In my heart of hearts have I denied thee. Speak, dear Lord, or speak and tell me now. And yes, this last year, everything we haven't been able to play music together, we to sing together, we haven't seen our families. Uh, the LA traffic has been fantastic. Um, going to school has been different. Uh, many of us are Zoomed out. This is my third Zoom meeting today and it's only uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we've had online concerts, online rehearsals, work is different. We have new fears. Um, we can't get haircuts. Uh, we can't go to restaurants, we can't go to church, I miss seeing the kids at the core. Everything seems out of control. Um, society seems to be filled with hate. Um, the simple things in life are difficult, not what we used to. But um, we choose how we react to that list. Um, we also choose how we react to the things that have not changed this last year. Uh, the things that have not changed, God's love, God's desire for us to be better. God's desire for us to be in a closer relationship with him. God's desire for us to love one another. And that includes the loss, the hurting, and the vulnerable. Um, God's desire for us to work to bring others closer to him. His promise of grace, comfort, uh, healing, and his unconditional love. And the mission of the Salvation Army has not changed. So, um, my final words, if I can have any wisdom, are uh, this is not the time to retreat. It would be too easy to do so. But being a Christian and maybe being a soldier in this army is never about retreating. It's time to be more engaged with God for us and then with our communities. So think how you can reach out in different ways, pray for one another, pray for your leaders, and look positively towards the future. Thanking God for what we have, what we've been through, and seek his guidance on how we can be more effective, reaching more people in his name with our ministry. So my scripture verse, just to finish, is uh, one verse from John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not. Amen. Thank you so much, Martin, for sharing with us. This certainly isn't a time to retreat. Let's look forward to what God has in store for us. We need all hands on deck. Everybody has uh, a part to play. And we look forward with great hope and anticipation to getting back to what we enjoy doing so much. But for, for now, Martin, thank you so much for your time this evening for us, this afternoon for you. Very much appreciate you coming on and sharing with us at Millfield. Thank you for all that you have done so well for the Army, and now but we know you will continue to do so well for the Army. You really are a role model of mine and, uh, and certainly have been a role model for many, particularly those very innovative recordings with the tab. So thank you for all that you've done, and uh, may God continue to, to bless you. And to everybody who has joined us either via Zoom, Facebook, or indeed watched the recording back at a later time, thank you for sharing with us. So let's share a prayer and then we will get on with whatever we need to do next. So Lord God, thank you for the opportunity to gather virtually and for the gift of technology, which enables us to do so. I thank you for Martin for his time today and how he has encouraged and challenged us through his message and contributions. Lord, continue to use him in the best ways and in new ways in these days. 
Lord, we acknowledge that today marks 12 months since the UK went into lockdown. And Lord, we just remember all those who have suffered and all who have served this year. And we just ask your blessing on our world, Lord. And we pray for restoration. We pray for a restoration of our communities. Uh, we pray for restoration of our economies. We pray for restoration of our churches. We pray for full churches, Lord, and for the day where we can gather back together in our buildings. Lord, we ask a blessing on all those who have engaged in this virtual event. Lord, make your presence a tangible reality in their lives this day. And until we can meet in person, until we can gather in our groups, until we can make music and worship in the way we all enjoy so much, Lord, keep us safe and keep us well. Amen.